golfers are becoming more optimized in terms of maximizing strokes gained. Um, that's that's why we see golfers, um, you know, hitting certain clubs off of tees. Why are more people going for, you know, the green at Riviera? Why are more people, you know, less people laying up? You know, so the driving distances in those holes ha- has gotten huge. If you, if you like looked at it over time, if you're just looking at the data and you go, wow, look at how much the driving distance on this drivable par four has increased. But that's not a function of people getting faster. That's, that's a function of strategy. People realizing that this is the best way to maximize strokes gain. Sasha, you're doing a lot. Uh, professor, Futual Advisor, Biomechanist, the Stack System. What's a day in your life look like? Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> right now over the winter, I teach teach a couple of classes. I teach an introductory biomechanics class and an advanced biomechanics class in my my lab here. Um, I've got everything kind of aligned, in, at least in golf. You know, so most of my examples in my intro class are about golf. Um, my advanced class is all about uh, golf and applying biomechanical principles to that. Um, but, uh, you know, lots of conversations with, with tour coaches. At least speak to someone like uh, Mark Blackburn or Chris Como um, every day. Um, working with a few players. So I'll have, a, you know, a few conversations with uh, someone like a Matt Fitzpatrick, um, usually around his stack training. Um, I've got a project I'm doing right now with, uh, with Ping. I'll be can kind of see a, a putter over my head where we're looking at... Um, uh, trying to test different putter weightings and how they influence the the stroke. Um, I usually have some Footjoy shoes kicking around. You can see some in the background. So I've got a project going on with Footjoy. Uh, this afternoon, I'm collecting some data for Rapsodo. Um, heading to the PGA show. So get, getting um, lots of messages going on with that, setting up the stack booth. So there's <laughs> my dates are pretty varied. Coach Hockey. I also have three kids, so spend a lot of time in the ring. Hockey. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's good. It's, it's good. Is there a stack system for? There isn't. I'd love. I'd love to get into the uh, the theories, but hockey uh, hockey slap shot is um, very very different from a golf swing. Um, you know, uh, golf swing you can completely let go of the club at impact, and it will have no influence on ball speed. Uh, hockey. Um, you can't let go of the stick at impact. You need to be applying maximum force when the stick hits the ice uh, to store energy in the shaft, and then that gets deflected into the puck. So completely different uh, physical uh, principles at play between maximizing puck velocity and ball velocity in golf. Okay. So there is a stack system for baseball. People... There is a stack system for baseball. That's right. Okay. Biomechanics. I think people... You hear it and you have an idea of, of what that means. Um, but can you give us sort of a baseline definition when we're talking about biomechanics and what we're looking at? Yeah, sure. Uh, biomechanics is rooted in uh, physics, mechanical physics. It's, it's like engineering. So it's effectively Newton's laws, F equals MA, um, torque equals I alpha. Those are the, 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 the basic fundamental principles. But Instead of applying it to machines or, or robots, um, we apply it to uh, humans. And there are specific ways that humans humans generate force with their muscles. So we need to, you know, kind of um, broaden uh, our understanding of those physical principles to include some biological concepts as well. And if uh, if we're looking at sport performance, then you want to take those principles and apply them to figure out the best way to move. What, what, what's the best way to generate speed, given the, the, you know, the properties of the human body and understanding the physiological principles? Is there a way that's uh, better to move a golf club for repeatability? Um, is there a better way to design a golf club to interact with that human when they're applying uh, muscular forces? Okay. So, I mean, what, what got you interested in working in, in, in that field? Um, 
Definitely a big sports fan uh, growing up. I really, you know, participated in a lot of sports. I uh, played uh, volleyball and did track and field at university, um, but also have a, uh, a real passion for, for math and engineering. And it seemed like a great way to marry the two. You know, it wasn't like a, a focused effort going through my undergrad. It was like, hey, I like kinesiology like stuff but i also like taking engineering computer science math and um really like golf and boy this seems like a, a great way to to mix everything together um you know 20 years ago when i was kind of doing my phd and customizing shaft stiffness to a person's swing uh you, you you could see a big difference between golf science and say track and field science and track and field was much further ahead there was a few little pockets in golf science that were trying to make headway you know things like search the perfect swing world scientific congress of golf but for the most part it was um a lot of uh a lot of misinformation um Generally out there, things weren't very strong from a scientific standpoint. You know, if you talk to somebody, hey, you know, give me a good golf science book, they'd give you the the golfing machine. Someone said, hey, you should read this during your PhD thesis. So um, it, it seemed like uh, there was a lot of opportunity to to apply math and physics and science and principles of kinesiology into into golf. So when you're looking at and you mentioned hockey, baseball, so in terms of the movements necessary in golf, what sports are similar? How do one sport to the next, which is closest to golf? And um, how are the yeah, muscles you're using in golf different from other sports? Yeah, so I think it depends on the specific skill you're looking at. So if you're looking at driving a golf ball, um, hitting a baseball is – you know, very, very similar um, in terms of your, you, you have an implement, um, you know, ballpark relative to all other implements. A baseball bat is similar-ish to a golf club. You know, it's heavier, it's shorter, um, but it's closer than a tennis racket. It's probably a little bit closer than, you know, um, than, than a lot of other implements. Um, but then you'd say, okay, well, what are some differences that we'd expect to see? Well, you know, a golf club swung at a plane that's at about uh, 45 degrees, give or take a little bit. Baseball is much flatter. So if we're looking at if I'm, you know, I do some uh, consulting um, in the baseball space as well. I've had some phone calls with the, uh, a lot of work with the Dodgers, work with the Red Sox, um, with hitting. And, you know, from a, say, a ground reaction force perspective, in, in golf, you need to generate angular momentum in the frontal plane as much as you do in the horizontal plane. In baseball, it's much more about the horizontal plane because of the way the bat moves. Um, and then, you know, you have to recognize the differences that um, in golf, you can take all the time in the world to hit the ball. So you have uh, different limitations for maximizing clubhead speed in golf. Clubhead speed is super important in golf. Bat speed is super important in baseball. But in baseball, you don't have all the time in the world to take your swing. You know, you so you got a different set of constraints um, around the baseball hitter. But if you're looking at putting, then I wouldn't look at golf. You know, I'd look maybe something closer to like billiards or darts or, you know, lawn bowling to imply principles mm -hmm. from, from those sports um, to a skill like putting. What about tennis? I think when I, when I think about using ground forces for hitting, I think about tennis players kind of getting off the, off the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, te tennis, uh, even a little more extreme would be badminton. I use badminton a lot to show how different um, the principles of using the ground are in something like golf versus badminton. I'll use badminton over tennis uh, or uh, because tennis is somewhere in the middle but still closer to badminton um, in that uh, the ground becomes less important uh, the lighter the implement is. So if you were trying to generate maximum club head speed with the driver – um, and let's say your swing was 100 miles an hour um, and you had, a, you know, for your physical abilities, that was a great swing, 100 miles an hour. Well, if we dropped you out of an airplane uh, in a vacuum, that was possible in outer space and said, hey, how fast can you swing the golf club? And we gave you lots of practice at it. You'd probably only be able to swing it at 60 miles an hour. Um, so your ability to use the ground, add angular momentum into the system really helps the ability to generate uh, club head speed. 
with badminton, uh, your racket speed would be virtually unchanged. Most of the um, fastest racket speeds in badminton, 150 mile an hour plus uh, speeds, can be generated um, in free fall. So you jump in the air, make a smash, you don't need any angular momentum in the system. Um, so t tennis, helpful to have a little bit more, but um, yeah, uh, actually, um, you don't need a whole lot of ground interaction um, in tennis to necessarily maximize uh, racket speed. Okay. So the stack system, I definitely want to talk about. I'm a a user, subscriber, and uh, it helped me out a lot. I used it in the off season. Probably should have kept using it through the whole season, but it did help me out a lot. Um, definitely picked up some speed. To, the app is a lot of fun, sort of following your yeah. progress and your potential distances as they grow. and. Uh, so it's to tell TS members that you're getting 20% off the stack system, uh, which is the perfect way to kick off your off-season work. Uh, go to your member locker. Well, not now. Hang here uh, and listen to us. Uh, but then grab your code in your member locker and pick up the stack today. Uh, so if folks aren't familiar with the stack at its core, what is it? I mean, they see, okay, there's this stick, there's weights. What is it? What is yeah, so there's um, the, the biggest difference is the app and the philosophy we take um, to what I'll call speed training. There are some important differences with the hardware. So the, the stack system hardware ha is configurable into 30 different weight options. Um, and uh, most of the other systems out there aren't, don't have that level of resolution. And that ties in, uh, we need that resolution to tie in with our philosophy. Um, on the surface, it might seem uh, similar. Hey, we're swinging something that's heavy and we're swinging something that's light. You know, we call it overspeed and, and overload training. Um, but it, when we prescribe, so when you're going to do a workout, Tom, and we say, hey, load on 105 grams. What we're trying to do is target a specific percentage of your driver's speed. So we know how fast you're swinging your driver from the baseline. In every session, we also track the stack weight that is very close to your driver. So we know how your speed's changing. And in every workout, we're adjusting the weights you're swinging to match a certain percentage of your swing speed. Um, and... It, that's for the overspeed training, but we also do overload training. <clears throat> it's it it seems similar when you're in the app. If you're the user, you just go, oh, load on 240 grams. But the research that's gone into that um, is quite extensive. So we don't just want when you do overload training. It's it's not like you can say, well, swing something that's 20 percent heavier. You. Uh, should be targeting the load that's applied to the golfer, not the load in the implement. Um, so maybe we've uh, taken 195 grams on the end of the stack system. That equates to very similar loads to your driver. Well, if we say, hey, load an extra 50 grams on there and you get up to 245, that doesn't mean that the load that is experienced by your body is an extra 45, 50 grams. And it's not even a percentage of the weight that's increased. There's a very complex relationship there between the weight you add onto an implement and the loads experienced by the body. So what we want to do is have the loads experienced by the body change by, you know, five, maybe maximum 10%. So I have to go into my lab using the, the motion capture system you have here, using the force plates that are uh, over to my right and do systematic research where we have people swing their driver, measure the loads, and then we have them swing various weights to figure out, okay, what are the loads that they are experiencing? And so e even right down to, um, it looks like we're just changing the weights on the end, but what we're actually manipulating is the center mass of the stack, the moment of inertia of the stack, and the overall weight. And that allows us to specifically hit those loads on the body that we want to just target the right amount of stimulus to get the best adaptation for overload training uh, as well as over speed. So the philosophy is a little more complex. It's very simple. 
um, and easy to follow from the from the user standpoint. But there's a lot of research that went into um, developing uh, the the programs that we use. For sure, very easy to use. Um, but yeah, as I'm using it, or as anyone who's used it, you have you're wondering, oh, I wonder why am I swinging today a, a lighter weight to start than a heavier weight. And, and pro, your program sort of changes. Um, where does that, where did that science come from? Is it trial and error? Like how do you line up like okay, you know, building the daily program. So it started with some very uh, fundamental research uh, uh, of simply okay, once once we you know kind of have an idea of of what weights people should swing to get certain loadings and overspeed versus overload. Um, then you say, okay, well, let's let's put it in practice. Um, let's run an experiment. What happens if we have a group of people, they just do overload training? How much weight's too much? Where they don't start to see continual increases in speed. What about over speed training? Um, how light can we go? Should we be swinging at 110% of our driver's speed? Maybe 112. Does 118 get too fast? Um, should you do overload and over speed training? Uh, in the same week, in the same session? Should you do three weeks of overload, then three weeks of overspeed? All these questions we addressed, you know, iteratively over about eight years to come up with some initial programs. Okay, we're pretty sure these are really good guidelines to put in an app um, that will help people get faster. And, and sprinkled in there is also um, some research on a, does Tom respond better to a program that is slightly more overspeed or slightly more overload? But since we've launched the app, we can now really, we, we've ramped up the pace at which we can do research. So in my lab here, I could bring in a group of 30 golfers to do overload, 30 golfers to do overspeed, which would be a lot for university study, track them, see the progress. Well, today, we have 50 new golfers signing up for the stack system. We're going to get entered into a program. Well, we are running experiments. We also have about 200 golfers that have already signed up today to start their second or their third program. Great. They're getting entered into an experiment. So the, the app is in this infinity loop of progress where we start to say, hey, is 20 seconds, like very specific questions that you would never ask in a typical academic setting because it would take decades and decades to answer all, all of these questions. Is 20 seconds rest better than 30 seconds rest? Should you do uh, an overspeed set, then followed by an overload set? Should you, if you're phasing out a program, if you're doing an, an eight week program, how should you change the volume of overspeed and overload throughout the program? So all these, all these questions, uh, now the, the, the research and answer them can be accelerated because we've got 30,000 users um, and, you know, like we, we track now close to, I think, 17 or 18 million swings where we know every single swing, we know the weight the person swung, the speed they swung it, their age, how much rest they've had. Um, yeah, it really, really accelerates the research. The way to swing the club, or rather the stick, different than the golf, than, than one swings the golf club, the same, similar, um, and also in the system, you know, where where there are different levels of how you ask the players to swing. Um, so, how does one go about physically using it? Should we swing it like a golf club? Uh, is there a different way to use it? What if our swing's pretty lousy, and are we now just getting lousier because <laughs> because we're swinging it poorly and now it's going faster? Yeah, you you. You won't get lousier. I'll say that. That's um, uh, that's probably true. Um, I have a lot to unpack there. Uh, so, yes, you should, for the most part, swing it like a golf club. Um, but uh, you know, at, at the very simplest level, you when you start out in a program, we ask you to swing it at what's called full intent, which is the fastest you would ever swing in a golf course. So I give an example of imagine you're on a par five, relatively wide open fairway. Uh, you know, you need an eagle to force a playoff. You're on 18. You know what the, how the group in front of you uh, finished. Um, 
So however hard you would swing there, you know, you can't swing out of your shoes because if you top it, well, you're not making an eagle. So, you know, but you, you still want to send it down there pretty far. So the full intent is as much effort as you would ever use in a competitive round of golf. And you spend a lot of the first program, the foundation program, swinging at that level of effort. Um, but then we have you move into uh, what's called max intent, which is, look, we're just trying to absolutely – um, get this club moving as, as fast as we possibly can. And that's usually where you should have some self-awareness. And I've got lots of FAQs on, on this, uh, around this topic on the, the Stack System uh, webpage. But here's a good way to think of it. Um, every stacker is somewhere on a continuum during their training. And you can you could move within the continuum within a workout. On one end of the continuum um, are golfers that should just 100% focus on, on speed. Just get that radar number cranking out as high as speed as possible. And, and I'll give you an example of someone that should be at that end of the continuum. Uh, a former tour player, he's now on the, you know, the Champions Tour. His club head speed when he played was 115. It's now down to 95. Uh, hasn't missed a fairway since 2017, okay? This person uh, needs to focus on 100% effort, just make the number as fast as possible. Um, he's, he's, you know, he's, it, this, that goes for a lot of LPGA players that, um, that, that I work with as well. Um, but then there's lots of people that could fit into that end of the continuum. On this other end of the continuum might be uh, a, a high handicapper. So this is someone who's, you know, certainly trying to work on speed, but they can also make a lot of progress on improving the mechanics of their swing. And you can play with that, you know, that, that, that level of uh, the continuum. Um, I think that answered a couple of your questions. You, they certainly did. I think when it comes to mechanics, if you're getting, if your numbers are improving, I found, um, at least this is just from my experience that, you know, your mechanics are probably, um, probably in a good place. I found myself, okay. Uh, as I'm working and, and going through the, the, the exercises, you know, I have a tendency to sort of not use my lower body and not use my, any sort of hip turn. And, and obviously that's going to detract from my speed. So when I was starting to, to do that more, and think about that a little more. My speeds were going up. Um, I mean, good speed probably reveals there's probably decent mechanics there. One hundred percent. That that that's a very sound principle to follow. Is that better mechanics? Um, better mechanics for repeatability are probably going to be associated with with higher speed levels. There's if we look at the physical abilities of a lot of amateurs, they exceed. Um, tour players, but those tour players can generate a lot of speed because they have better mechanics. You know, Matt Fitzpatrick, um, the last tournament in Hawaii, his average club head speed was 118.6. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's pretty good speed for his physical capabilities because he has good mechanics. You know, so if he, when his mechanics break down, his speed doesn't jump up. You know, his, his, his speed gets slower with his mechanic so he, he for him he can certainly look at those speed numbers and say yeah if my speed's lower it's because my mechanics aren't great and, and that applies to a lot of us as well yeah how fast can a human being you've done all the research you've got the lab there how fast can a human being swing the golf club before they poke a hole in the universe <laughs> Well, right now, are we close to, I think, with a, is it a 48-inch driver? Seb Waddell, is that the, the chap's name, is pretty close to 170 miles an hour. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. The, the sport is relatively new. Um, I guess I would say that within the next 10 years, might not be crazy to think someone's close to 175, 176. But, you know, all, all human uh, performance continues to improve there's no reason to think it will ever stop um seems realistic to think that it will improve at a slower rate um but yeah there's always no matter what state you can imagine someone swinging at 176 you could look at it and say well 
if they just had a little bit more fast twitch, if, you know, they had just this little bit better coordination, um, if we could make the club just a little bit lighter, uh, we'd see an improvement. So um, it will continue to get faster forever, just like every other skill we do um, as humans. Um, there's a lot of wiggle room in the PGA Tour for clip and speed, though, that, that's for sure. Yeah, there's a pretty wide range out there for sure. And we've been hearing a lot about that when we're talking about uh, talking about the golf ball and the rollback, which I want to talk about. First, I want to ask you, though, if someone's trying to pick up speed, they're using the stack system um, in their off days or in their other days, they're also exercising and working out how to pinpoint, you know, what are the muscles and, or muscle groups or exercises or things that you suggest people uh might be doing to sort of augment their speed journey yeah i really like uh mike carroll fit for golf um um, um i don't know how many folks on here have followed him but uh i'm 99.99 percent aligned with his philosophies and he puts a lot out of a lot of excellent um exercises out there um uh you know it it, it depends if you sit at a desk, if you're a fair, big, strong guy, sit at a desk all the time, probably some mobility work, um, you know, opening up your hips, opening up your shoulders, um, not necessarily just static stretching, but but range of motion movements um, could be very helpful. If uh, you can't, you know, squat your own body weight and can't do a pull up, then probably you're better off doing some some strength training um, exercises. Uh, I think that you, you want to do, if you're not doing exercises where you can measure or see an improvement, or at least in how you feel, if you don't feel like you're getting more flexible, um, and then, then probably don't, those probably aren't, aren't worth it. Um, those are very generalized comments. Um, but, uh, I think the, mm -hmm. the exercises that I would recommend to someone very much depend on the, the state they're in a, a lot of, uh, the mini tour guys that I work with, um, are, you know, young guys have very little, if we're talking about club head speed, have very low, they're not going to gain a whole lot from getting a lot stronger. If you can do, you know, 10 pull-ups. And you can deadlift 350 pounds. A lot of these young kids can. Then you're you're not going to see much gains in terms of increase in club head speed from putting a lot more time in the gym necessarily. Um, probably you're going to see most of your gains from doing some some training with uh, something like the stack system. Now, where okay, so where do do you think the average golfer? Where do you think they most lose speed a couple of buckets um i was to guess uh, with the folks on here looking at some of the um all scratch players sasha all, uh, okay awesome um you have to be to be in the broken tea society i forgot to mention oh no kidding okay perfect that's very helpful no i am, I am you are kidding <laughs> um yeah. it, i was like this sounds really exclusive immediately i thought how are you I hear everybody has to submit scorecards and you get uh, booted out. Um, exactly. Uh, I, there's a couple of big buckets. You know, there's obviously mechanics. I think that's where probably most people's brains go towards. Um, so if you, you know, start training with, uh, with the stack system, um, hopefully there's some organic changes in your swing mechanics that improve club head speed just by, you know, Hey, taking a swing, you look at the radar number and the next swing you take, you happen to lift your lead heel, or you think about, I'm going to get my hand path a little longer, or you think about a faster backswing. So that self exploration, um, can lead to some natural changes. I don't want to use the word natural, but some, you know, kind of organic non-conscious integrations of, of swing mechanic changes. Um, uh, in, into your golf swing. Um, that's a big one. Sure. But an equally large one is, is people just realizing that they can swing faster. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of folks 
um, that have over time, they don't practice a whole lot. So they go out, maybe they hit a few balls in the range at best and they go to the first team they play and they've over time worked themselves into a very constrained swing, especially folks that are, you know, 45 to 75. Um, they, they get very safe out there and they, they don't realize that, um, with a little bit of practice, uh, you don't have to worry about increasing your dispersion um, if you're bringing more club head speed to the tee. I got a lot more thoughts on that, but those are two kind of big buckets. You, you change your mechanics and you um, just learn how to actually, it's it's okay to use a little bit more effort. Yeah, I think that's something you hear from a lot of people that are might be reluctant to get into speed training is that... Um, I don't, my ball is going right. My ball is going left. I don't want it to get there faster, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, to hit it farther offline. Um, and that, you know, if I'm on a first tee or in a big event, you know, I, I don't want to be ripping at it like, uh, like a beast, you know. Um, but can you speak to like, you know, the impact that, you know, trying to get your maximum capacity up actually has on your, on say your game swing? Yeah. So <clears throat> first of all, I'll say that that, that, that prob- probably doesn't apply to everybody. Some people might already be swinging at a very high percentage. Those folks, I do not want them swinging any faster. There's just a bucket of folks that are, that are playing golf at like 80% of their maximum and going up to 90 is definitely not going to have a negative impact, uh, especially with a bit of speed training. But overall, the the, the philosophy uh, with the stack system that we use is is it's to increase your maximum club head speed potential so that you can actually play golf at a lower percentage, but that lower percentage is faster than your current club head speed. <laughs> so I've I've got a. a, a an example here, let's say that your current maximum club head speed, you're super warmed up, it's 95 degrees, lovely day in Orlando, and the fastest you can swing the club is 100 miles an hour. But you're playing at 95, okay? That's, that's, that's how fast you, 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 you swing the club on the first tee. You're at 95% of your maximum. Engage in some stack training. Um, you improve your maximum swing speed from 100 to 110 over eight weeks. But now you're playing golf at 100 miles an hour. That's what you tee off. You're not teeing off at 95 anymore. You've increased by five miles an hour. You're playing at 100, but 100 as a percentage of 110 is only 90. So you're actually playing at a lower percentage of your maximum effort. I would fully expect, in, at, given those percentages, that you'll be a little bit more repeatable. Um, and this is what uh, Fitzpatrick did initially. Um, you made some, you know, three years ago now, but made some nice gains in his maximum club head speed potential, but only increased his on-course speed by a couple of miles per hour. And his dispersion actually decreased. Ball was going further, dispersion was less, and this is using his own statistics that uh, Eduardo Maldonari collects, so he knows where his target is and where the ball landed relative to his own target. Um, so, that was pretty cool to see club head speed go up by a couple of miles an hour, dispersion decrease. Ball's going further, dispersion tighter, but that was because he was swinging at a lower percentage of his maximum. And as he continued to um, increase his club head speed, we started to um, actually have him swing absolutely faster relative to you know uh, the world, but um, actually increase his percentage as well to more optimize his strokes gained off the tee. Um, so, you know, there's a certain balance between, okay, well, I could gain five more yards, but I'll, you know, hit a few more balls offline. There's a, there's a balance between those that, that will optimize your strokes gained. Um, initially, he, you know, you, you're probably not optimizing your strokes gained if you're hitting it further and straighter. You know, it sounds right, but you could probably actually swing even faster. Um, so we, we found a sweet spot there in the summer of uh, 2021. Well, you certainly did. Uh, so good, good to know. We, you know, just because I'm sweating and grunting and coming out of my shoes in my garage, it's not necessarily what I'm going to be doing on the golf course. Um, but yeah, your your gamer swing um, 
you know, just picking up even a little bit of speed, uh, a, a big advantage there. Yeah, if you look, I'll say, the, we'll, 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 one more example, if you don't, if you don't mind, if, uh, because it's, it's an excellent yeah. one. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that are worried about chasing speed. I get this, uh, you know, every once in a while from a tour player, Hey, you know, I might want to do some stack training, but I'm worried I'm going to lose my swing or we're just going to go crazy. Um, like him or hate him, Bryson DeChambeau is, is an awesome example of this. You know, when he was on the PGA Tour, he decided, I'm going to get faster. Now, he did a lot of things. I'll, I'll save that conversation for, for another time unless people, you know, want me to answer some questions about it. But bottom line is he greatly increased his maximum all speed potential. <clears throat> so uh, I think, you know, when he was last on the PGA Tour, his ball speed average was around, you know, low 190s. Let, let's, for easy math, let's say 190. If there's, I don't know if there's any fact checkers on here, but if someone, let's say low 190s, 190, just for easy math. And at, at that time, you know, everybody was kind of like, huh, wow. And now he's at the top of the strokes gained off the tee performance. Um, so really good drivers of the golf ball like Rory are like, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go chase this speed idea. And in that is the thought that I need to now swing with more effort on the course. So Rory's ball speed, let's say, is 185, 186. Yeah, I'm just going to ramp this up to the low 190s. I'm going to start swinging at 190. But what they don't realize is that Bryson's maximum ball speed is closer to 210. You know, when he's do, was, he was doing the World Long Drive competition shortly after the, the Ryder Cup, he was hitting ball speeds 218, 219. Now, granted, with world long drive competition stuff. So let's be really conservative and say it's 210. Well, if he's playing with a ball speed of 190, that's only 90% of, of 210. Whereas Rory trying to play at a ball speed of 190, he's up at a much higher level. So it looks like at, you know, 190 ball speed, oh, that, that's crazy. How is he hitting it on the planet? Well, there's not a very high percentage of his maximum effort. Um, so you can do that. It might look wild, but it's relatively controlled for him. Um, so that, that concept of, of, of playing at a percentage of your maximum effort and training to improve your maximum abilities is, is really important. So you mentioned, you, you mentioned Matt Fitzpatrick a few times and your work with him was, you know, uh, what, what a year he had that year. And, um, well documented his increase his hard work on picking up speed um and also very well known as a very um studious and you know tracking his shots and you know was he sort of the ideal the ideal pupil yeah absolutely was um uh i don't uh i don't have a lot of time I do a lot of things. I, I enjoy working with with players, but um, I don't have a lot of time to add new, um, you know, new players. I don't. I like going to the odd event. But I don't like being on tour that much. I've got a family anyway. So <laughs> it was it was a very nice um, opportunity. It was during COVID. It was a real hassle to actually uh, go and work. I had to like isolate in a cabin in the middle of nowhere and. Uh, Nova Scotia for two weeks um, after I went down to visit him, but I, I did that because it, it, you know, absolutely. He 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 was the perfect person to work with. He's um, really determined, amazing work ethic, um, follows science, attention to detail. Um, yeah, that was it. Was yeah, I got really lucky. Are there any shots that you recall from the Open at Brookline where you'd think ah? that shot he might not have been able to pull that shot off other you know before oh. the speed training and, and what did that feel like every every drive i mean he was uh, yeah every drive um you know like even on uh, you know he was driving it past dj um earlier in the week and then you know will zalatoris is not short uh but he was driving it past will all day but there was the drivable par four no one drove it Alt had drove, driven the green all Sunday. Uh, it's cold, you know, you're in, in contention and you hit 181 ball speed and you're the only person to drive the green and have an eagle putt. You know, that's, you know, when, uh, when I started working with him and his coach, Mike Walker, reached out and they said, look, the next step is to start winning majors. And we just finished playing with Dustin Johnson 
at Augusta, DJ on hole 11 has got an eight iron in and, you know, we're hitting a four iron uh, into hole 11. That wears you out four rounds at Augusta, you know, and, and that most of the other tournaments are the same. The PGA plays long, US Open plays long. So it's like, you know, it's it, your, your odds on being able to break through and win majors, if you're not hitting the ball far, it just puts way too much pressure on other parts of your game. You know, it's possible, but... Boy, uh, boy, you know, you, you, you really want to be hitting the ball further. And yeah, so it, it was it was a small improvement to, you know, the overall picture of how awesome his game is. But um, it was kind of what what made the glass kind of spill over, I think. So you talked a little bit about I want to tie that to, to the rollback. You talked a little bit about, um, you know, that over time, you know, speeds are just because of, of the way the trajectory of sports and athletics uh, speeds will continue to go up. Um, and in response to that, uh, you know, the, the USJ and RNA have come up with their change in testing standards. Um, what are your thoughts on the rollback? Um, do you <laughs> what, Is it your fault? <laughs> uh, is one, you probably get people asking you that. Yeah. Well. Probably a little bit. I mean, I, I, I've, you know, the long list of uh, tour players that are using the stack and I can, you know, see how speed has, uh, has increased. Um, so it's certainly moved the average up. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's not a well-defined problem. I've got no problem with a rollback per se. It just bothers me when you're, you're not you're not defining a problem. Hey, th- this is the issue we're going to try to solve, and this is why we think what we're doing will solve this issue. Um, just really bad science the, the the way they're approaching it. Um, it's just disappointing from that level. Uh, I don't think it's going to have the intended effect. Um, but the main reason being is people. There's a couple of couple of issues, I guess. Um, so we look at driving distance. We go, okay, yeah, we don't want people to hit the ball any further. And we think that that's a function of club head speed. I say we, let's just say the USG and the RNA. I'm, I'm assuming this is their, their logic. Well, um, if we slow the ball down, club head speeds are going to stay the same. So therefore, the ball will go shorter. But that's missing reality of what's happening golfers are becoming more optimized in terms of maximizing strokes gained um that's that's why we see golfers um you know hitting certain clubs off of tees why are more people going for you know the green at riviera why are more people you know less people laying up you know so the driving distances in those holes has gotten huge. If you if you like looked at it over time, if you're just looking at the data and you go, wow, look at how much the driving distance on this drivable par four has increased. But that's not a function of people getting faster. That's that's a function of strategy. People realizing that this is the best way to maximize strokes gained. Um, so if if you if you slow the ball down. Golfers are still going to try to maximize their strokes gain. So someone like, let's say, Tony Finnau, who's swinging faster at the start of this year, but he has the ability to swing at 140 miles an hour. He would never probably bring that on the course, but he might bring 126, 127. That's well within a percentage that he could, you know, still hit the fairway. But he's playing at 120. You slow the ball down for him, and he looks at it, you know, the majority of par fours he's playing and you slow the ball down, the ball's going to be in the fairway. So then he says, okay, I want to optimize my strokes gain instead of swinging at 120. Hey, I'll, I'll just hit this slower ball at 124. And now I'm back to re-optimizing uh, for my strokes gained. And then there'll be players who won't be able to do that overnight. There'll be players that have done what Fitzpatrick has done. And say, hey, I'm going to really get at some speed training. Um, Someone like, you know, Dustin Johnson, whose ball speed has stayed, you know, over the course of his career, very constant around, you know, 180, maybe a little bit lower than that. If all of a sudden, when DJ was in his 20s, if you said, hey, play the slower ball, he would have 
done some more intense training and jumped up his club head speed so that his ball speed jumped back up to, you know, 178, 180 to, to optimize a strokes gain. And then you'd have players um, that wouldn't be able to adapt, you know, um, that, that wouldn't do the training. Those players will slowly get replaced by the, the, the kids coming out of college who maybe aren't as great short game players or putters, but now there's this increased emphasis on uh, reward for being able to hit the ball further. So that, uh, if, if you really wanted to have an effect, going along with that is understanding that we're currently at a very low percentage of what club at speed could be. So right now the PGA Tour averages 115-ish. That's what it was last year. That's not fast. Right, fast is 170. That's what the maximum is that people can generate right now. There's a lot of room between 115 and 170. I'm not saying the average is going to get to 140. There'll be people making swings at 140, the odd swing on the PGA Tour. But is it that hard to fathom that the top 150 golfers in the world can't move the average club at speed from 115 to say 120, 125, knowing that they're everybody on here has played with someone in the last six months who swings at 120, 125, you know, um, these are the best 150 athletes in the world. Let's compare it to baseball. Does anybody play, you know, local pickup baseball with someone who can throw a hundred mile an hour fastball? No, <laughs> they don't. Um, so it, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of room to have that average club head speed tick up. So I think slowing the ball down a little bit, um, we'll just be right back to, to where we are now. Um, and then we'll have to, you know, very quickly we'll have to slow the ball down again. The more we slow the ball down, you know, there's, there's that comes back to the ill-defined nature of the problem. You know, it's like, well, what problem are we solving? People like, well, I like shots. People that are for the rollback say, well, I like shot shaping. I, you know, I want to see these finesse players. If you slow the ball down enough, you're, you're just going to have bombers out there. Those are the only people that are going to be able to um, really compete, right? It's it, it, 10 years ago, David Tom, or maybe longer than that, 15 years ago, David Tom's at 104 and 105 was, you know, kind of competing out there. There's no more 104, 105 players. As the average moves up, the bottom has to move with it. Um, there's a lot of thoughts. I don't even know if I'm still connected to this. Those are good <laughs> thoughts, though. Yeah, no. Very, very interesting thoughts, though, Sasha. Um, gosh, we could talk about this more. Do you quickly, do you have, do you think there's a better approach to yeah. this issue of? Distance and courses getting becoming obsolete versus instead of the ball. Yeah. Okay. So here's the problem: is that um, you know Mike Mike Wong come on and said, "Hey, I got this folder of courses that we can't play currently because they're too short." Well, we're going to roll back the ball, and every, all those courses are still staying in that folder. So that's confusing. I you know like what so but what what you need to do instead of do this abstract pie in the sky feeling stuff, show me a hole. Show me, find a course, find 10 holes that are like, hey, these are the problem holes. These are the holes that were, they're not being played the way we want. And go get a slow ball and say, hey, let's give Rory a week with this slow ball. Let's see how he eventually figures out how to play it. Or Tony Finnow or someone. Does this solve the problem? And, you know, maybe it doesn't. There's, there's already clues around course design. You can go through Shotlink and you can say, look at all the average club head speeds on par fours. And you can go, huh, this is a long par four. Why is the average club head speed so low? You know, wh wh why is the average club head speed in this hole really high? You know, what you look at an overhead view and you're like, wh why is why are these long bombers not cutting the corner on this dog leg left in this hole? And then you look at the hole design from actually on the T box. And you look just a little bit to the left and you see a very inconspicuous 20 foot pine tree, not, not ruining the hole at all. No one sees it. They look down the fairway. The only person that sees that 20 foot pine tree is Bryson, who's trying to take this crazy line. So he looks and he goes, I can't get my ball over that. You know, as an example, because we can all picture the hole, Bay Hill, you know, if you didn't want someone taking the... I'm, I'm not saying I'm for this. I thought 
hit, you know, Bryson going for the greenish and uh, that hole was awesome. But if you're like, hey, I don't like that, it, you want people to to look at more down the fairway, you know, out of sight. It doesn't have to be super close, you know, 20, 30 feet away, put a pine tree. Now you go, okay, that, that line's no longer there, but it does nothing to the aesthetic of the course. Um you know, you, you you put some 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 features, some de- course design features. That's the that's the first way that I would approach it. That seems like, hey, we think this course on the ro- PGA Tour rotation next year is going to be played not the way we want. You know, there's we're, we're going to have to increase the length of these tees. Well, maybe let's do an experiment instead of increasing the length of the tees. What if we had the rough pinch in at 330 yards? You know, what if we added a, 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 a gorse bush here? What if we put a tree here? Just make some subtle design changes that aren't particularly expensive. Do an experiment like that. Do an experiment where you slow the ball down um, and have, you know, some people play a hole and see what happens. Just don't, like, it just seems seems like lazy science to just say, hey, we're not really going to do much testing with this new ball, and, and you know, uh, with and, and we don't really know what the problem is. But uh, hey, let's do it and see what happens. I don't know. Hey, ball rollback solves a problem. Okay, whatever. I just don't like the way they're approaching. It doesn't seem optimal. Approaching it as a scientist, which would only be yeah. appropriate, Sasha. I can't thank you enough for your time. I can't let you go though without asking, getting to a couple questions from our guests. That's okay. I got, or rather, our audience. I got, uh, I got another half an hour, so I'm here. If, if well, there we go. How about what's going on with stack putting? That seems out of those. How does yeah, yeah? Stack. How do we align what we're what you know what we're doing in terms of swing speed with uh, with our putting? Yeah, stack putting. Might be better than than stack speed training. Um, uh, you know, basically, I thought it was the the lowest hanging fruit. A lot, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is around you know helping my own game and helping the players that I work with. Um, you know, with the stack system, it was a spreadsheet with you know people like Fitzpatrick, and I'm like, hey, this would be way you know easier if it was in an app. You know, there's some motivation there. Um, but when I'm you know uh, designing putting practice sessions it's like wow this be you know a lot better if i put this into an app so i i think i think stack putting is both the the if you if you're going to put any time into your putting to practice it then stack putting is the best way to practice your putting if if you've got 20 minutes once or twice a week um it's going to get you the most bang for your buck for the vast majority of golfers out there for putting and it's going to give you the most insights um uh so yeah definitely it's it's free for all uh, everybody that gets a stack give it a go there's so so many features have you tried it tom i haven't tried it and i'm so i'm really curious just a little bit how it works yeah so um there's three modes the the best mode is called premiere and you hop in uh you need you need a you need a green to do premier mode you need a green that has at least a, a 30 foot putt and a bit of slope and the app basically sets up 18 holes for you and systematically walks you through them so it's like hey um hole one six feet uphill left to right so you look around the practice screen there could be other golfers out there it doesn't matter you find a hole that's got a six foot uphill uh, right to left putt. You've got this really slick interface that allows you to to say uh, why you've missed the putt. A couple of taps. It's real easy. Was did you hit it too fast? Did you hit it too far left? So a misread feature. Um, we keep track of your strokes gain putting for that hole as you go along, um, and you can. We've got strokes gain for everybody from a plus five handicap to a thirty handicap. So your strokes gain is relative to your ability. Runs you through 18 holes, tells you if you've got any speed bias, are you hitting putts too fast or too slow, if you've got any direction bias, and it accumulates your stats over time. So you can track your uh, your performance, you can try to adjust your biases, um, you know, so there's uh, plots that would tell you and insights that'll say, hey, you know what, um, 
you you're you seem to miss all your left to right putts on the high side. Um, and it's very clear in the interface that, that that's an issue you need to address. We also have this uh, really cool feature um, uh, that's called statistical comparison. And it came about, you know, for my own needs, but also, I don't know, folks on here remember Xander Shoffley a couple of years ago switching to the that arm lock grip. Everybody was all, you know, lots of golfers like, it should be illegal. It's awesome. It's too easy. Well, why isn't everybody doing it? You know, so he switched. He was, I think, 19th in strokes gained putting, switched, plummeted, and then switched back to his regular grip. And, you know, he was saying, well, I tested it out. I was like, did you really test it out? So in all the modes of stack putting, you can tag whether uh, what technique you're using, what putter you're using. And let's say you wanted to test out a different uh, way you were holding the putter. You go in one session, tag uh, the grip you're using. Next session, you use a different grip. And then after you've you know done four or five sessions, might take a week. Uh, maybe you've been doing it all summer, trying different putters, whatever. You can do the comparison for different points of time. You hit statistical comparison. It runs a legitimate, I teach quantitative research methods at university. It runs a legitimate statistical analysis um, to tell you which technique, which putter, Whatever factor you want to investigate in your putting um, is better. Uh, we've got and we've got an, mm-hmm. an on course mode. You can do all the stuff in premier mode, but on the course, we've got uh, aim point features built in, so you can enter the uh, the grade of, uh, of of the slope of the putt you're hitting it on. And then we've also got a um, a creative combines mode where you can create any practice session you want for putting. So I've got a little indoor putting green over here. It's um, you know it's only 22 feet long, 10 feet wide, and it's at a constant slope right now. But I can, for that green, go in and set up a, a, a practice session that I want that works for me. I can send that to any of the players in my stable. It could be a friend I'm competing with, could be a student that I'm working with, um, and they can complete that combine and track all these uh, cool stats. Very cool. That's in the app that, that I have. That's in the app that you have. It's an it's an app within an app. Um, and we we have we nice. we have launching any day now. Um, we're hoping to have it up for the PGA show. Um, it's uh, uh, it's going to be another tab at the bottom called Learning Library, and I've filmed uh, about seventy videos that we've got. I, I've come up with the system where we've got concepts swing moves and feels and drills and we've got um uh different videos covering you know ground reaction forces um swing mechanics so yeah all these videos for tips and things you can do to uh, incorporate into your your stack training and into your driver swing um it's a really cool little um interactive uh, library where you can do different searches and stuff and find these you know, some videos are 30 seconds. Some of the concept videos get up around uh, two minutes, but it's basically um, all these really cool thoughts that might help you while you're doing your, your stack training. We have some questions from folks on the timing of their workouts. Yeah. Um, how much is too long before, to wait between them? If you haven't been able to do it and you see diminishing returns, uh, you know, how is too how much is too soon? Um, I mean, there's guidance on the app when to come back, but, um, and also what, like what time of day is best, yeah. uh, okay. you know, to be doing your training. Sure. So, uh, here's some, some general guidelines. So first the app gives you a, a window, um, and it's an hour. So as we optimize, we have 30,000 golfers doing all this training. We start to quickly figure out what's too much time, what's not enough time. So instead of having it in days, it's down to hours. Sometimes that the the range that pops up in the app looks weird. It's like, you know, like after you finish your workout, it's like train before or after seven a.m. on the nineteenth, but before you know eleven p.m. on the, right. you know, but <laughs> it's, it's like, weird. I look, <laughs> yeah, but that that you doesn't have to you don't have to train at those weird times because we, we have people that are different time zones all over the world. They're traveling, so it might look funny, but it doesn't look funny. It might look funny to you, but it doesn't look funny to them necessarily. We do have it. To your specific time zone, but we don't know where you're traveling anyway, or maybe you've shift work. So some people are like, I don't want to train at four in the morning. Yeah. But maybe the, you know, the emergency doctor down the street from you does. Um, so, uh, any time in that window is, is fine. Um, 
vast majority of people, so we can look at all this data, swing fastest in the late afternoon, early evening. Early mornings for the majority of people are not great. Um, and uh, you certainly want to be training at a point of time in the day where you're swinging the fastest. So you might feel freshest in the morning, but if your speeds tend to be slower, that means you're not going to be um, getting the most out of your workout. So you could be mentally tired or even tired like from a feeling of like, oh, I've, you know, walk, just finished walking the course, you know, so maybe you've played 18 holes. Um, so your legs feel tired, but your swing speed might actually be pretty fast. You might be better off training after 18 holes than if you tee off at, you know, seven in the morning and trying to do your stack workout at six, that might be less optimal than training uh, after you play 18 holes. So when you swing the fastest is, is the best time to train. Um, and uh, you, relative to other physical activities, um, if you're doing intense workouts that are fatiguing, that will result in you swinging slower, and stack before that. So if you've got like a leg day where you do like six sets of squats and, uh, you know, five sets of deadlifts, and then you go to the leg press machine, then you do some lunges, you know, um, do your stack workout before that. If you do yoga, um, if that's your workout and you do a half an hour of stretching and mobility work, hey, that's probably a good thing to do before you stack. Um, if you go for a 15 mile run, probably should do that after you do your stack training. Um, I also, it's good to time your, your stacks. You know, if, if you have a really intense weight workout, for example, a really long run, better to do it on the day of the run or on the day of the hard workout before it and the next day because a lot of times we're in a state of recovery the next day and that will be even more impactful for our ability to generate high club head speeds happy to answer further questions around great advice or, oh i'll say this this is really important you 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 uh not everybody can stick to the program you know things happen so we can see hey what happens to these folks that are seemingly doing a really good job of sticking to the training when they do it but the gaps are like five days or six days, really bad idea. If you train, if you did an awesome stack workout, this is, this is a common occurrence with um, green grass accounts where like, I want to bring my, uh, you know, my clients in every Monday over the winter uh, and we'll do a stack session um, or uh, with a college coach. It's like, Hey, we're going to bring the gals in, um, you know, every Tuesday morning, that's when we're going to do our speed training, but we're going to do it, you know, for like six months. If you did an awesome stack session, you were super warmed up, hyped up, music blaring, ready to go, great workout every Monday for a year, 52 awesome workouts every Monday, I would expect you to gain no miles per hour, zero. You've just wasted every, wow. every Monday. Um, the, the frequency of those workouts is, is really important. If there's anybody on here that's ever lifted weights, it's usually a little bit longer for lifting weights, but let's say everybody will know if you do a really hard bench press workout and you wait eight or nine days, well, you've, you've, you've recovered from that workout, potentially seen some gains, but then you're right back to where you started. So all that's going to happen is you're just going to be really sore for the couple of days that follow. You're, you're not going to make any overall progress and you're going to increase your risk of injury. And it's going to be very, um, you know, mentally draining to be like, I'm putting in this effort. Why am I not getting faster? So uh, you don't need to go every second day, right? You don't need to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, you know, unless you're feeling really good, but don't let those, those times between sessions get, get five, six, seven days. Really, really avoid that. All right, folks, stick to it, would you? Yeah. Um, no, the, uh, I am one of the fallen. I've dropped off and need to pick it pick it back up. Actually, so for those of us who have, say, okay, we were winter stackers, um, winter's back, I want to get back into it. I guess we just kind of start from the beginning. Yeah, that's that's the life that I live. Um, you know, I'm in Canada right now. It's it's very cold. Um, there's no golf. In the summer, the three kids are all playing golf, uh, soccer, doing different things. You know, I, I'd like to stack more. Uh, I'll do speed priming sessions, but I just don't, you know, middle of July to the end of August and in September, I don't do any stacking. I, I treat it. It's something that I'll do for the rest of my life though, is, um, 
I'll lose a little bit of speed over the end of the summer. But hey, I've got six months here to make some hay. And I'll get, you know, get my speed back up to hopefully, you know, at the start of the spring, I'll be, I'll be playing closer to like 114, 115. Might drop down to 110 by the end of the summer. Um, and then, you know, when I'm maybe uh, the kids are out of the house and, and all I'm doing is golfing in the summer, if I'm retired, then, hey, you can train for the most part all year round. But um, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, I've taken some time off. But when you do get back into training, you know, for those off-season months, that, that's when you want to keep your, you know, make sure your frequency is uh, not getting too too far between those workouts. It's okay to be cyclical um, in your fitness. Would you would it be best to, for like for someone to go back to the sort of foundation program? Yeah, it, it depends on how much time you're taking off. That's what I like to do. Um, you know, so I did the uh, I just finished the foundation program, um, and I'm gonna uh, the app recommended a uh, trail arm enhancer for the first time you know i've been doing the stack system for three years i've got a pretty big difference between my my lead and trail arm my trail arm um tends to get uh slower um and i've taken all you know there's a lot of effort that's gone into programming a lot of decisions into the recommendations the the, the programming that decides what the workout should be that day I'm just a, a a regular stacker. Like I see the workout come up on my phone, and I'm like, "Huh, yeah, I guess that makes sense." I just whatever the pro whatever the app recommends for program, I select it. Like, so I'll have people say, "Hey, you know, take a look at my data. What program would you recommend?" You know, I, I spent you know hundreds of hours programming this app to make better decisions than me. It's all the same. It's all my philosophies. The app just doesn't make mistakes, and it's able to take in all this information that would take me an hour to sit down and try to sort through the app that does that very eloquently for us. The app does it. What does it do for folks are asking about um, if they're coming back from an injury or doing PT, how can, uh, you know, swinging a weighted implement, how can that be useful? Yeah. Uh, certainly that, that were, that's very specific to what you're rehabbing from. If your orthopedic surgeon, if your PT has said, yeah, you can play golf. Um, then, uh, these guidelines are important. If, if you can hit 40 balls, you know, a normal bucket of golf balls and feel okay the next day, um, or if you can go out and play nine holes of golf and feel okay the next day, then you are fine to, uh, start stacking, do a, do a foundation program. Um, you need to warm up. Early, so there's a 50 minute warm up in the app. Um, you need to be sweating before you do e training. Um, so fo follow the warm up guide in the app. But but the reality, uh, Tom, is that um, I get way more questions. Like the question you just asked me, we got 30,000 users uh, every week. I get a question saying I hurt myself playing golf. Um, or I hurt myself doing something else, but usually it's playing golf. I need to take a break from stacking. How do I get back into it? You know, very, very rarely do, do somebody associate an injury with uh, their stacking, considering that we've had, you know, 30,000 users and, you know, millions and millions of swings. The, 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 the likelihood of injuring yourself, the act of taking divots, um, you know, slamming a club really hard into the ground and taking a chunk of dirt or into a mat, it, the, the, the forces in the body are much higher um, than when we can gradually dis dissipate them during a, a, a follow through. Um, so those are the guidelines. Bucket of balls. Can you play nine holes? Um, make sure that you've been cleared to play golf by your PT or your orthopedic surgeon. Um, and we have, if you do find that maybe, ah, shoot, I, you know, I've been playing golf a lot. I've been practicing, squeezing in some stack workouts. I feel like a little bit of tendonitis is coming on. I feel like the heavy weights, maybe you got some arthritis in your hands. A lot of times the lighter weights, maybe if you have arthritis, um, the, the grip wants to pull out of your uh, bottom hand through impact um, forwards. You can, some, some users have said they've gotten a little knuckle pain. Um, we have the option to do a flex program. Um, and the flex program allows you to decide the every work that you go in you're like hey, okay i'm going to do a workout today nine options for that day's workout pop up 
you can do low volume, an eight minute workout, medium 50 minute workout, or a high volume 25 minute workout, depending on how you feel. And you can choose over speed only, a mix or overload only. And some people think overload is probably going to be harder for most people. A a lot of people find the over speed moving their body at, at high speeds, that can be a little more taxing. So depending on how you feel, you can choose one of those uh, nine workouts that that gives people rehabbing or if they're you know trying to nurse through uh, an injury a little bit more flexibility to ease themselves in, into uh, speed training. Okay. Well, you know, when I started doing this, one of my reservations was that like at least the swings that I admired and and wanted to copy or just think look like. You know, as opposed to, say, Bryson swinging very hard at the ball was not sort of be- aesthetically pleasing or beautiful or anything that that I wanted to to imitate. Uh, you know, I want to swing like Sam Snead. I want to swing like Ben Hogan, Bobby Jones, Fred Couples, that sort of oily swing. But they're probably swinging pretty fast. I mean, uh, how do you... Yeah. W- is there is there anything you know by by increasing speed? Is there any risk of um, for us purists out there becoming uh, bombers instead of um, instead of you know sweet slingers? Well, I'll tell you what the, the 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 best path to being able to swing like Freddie Couples and still have his clubhead speed is through speed training. If you know, think about how how many different ways yeah. um, uh, you know. Uh, Martin Borgmeier could look silky smooth at 115 miles an hour. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. uh, well, yeah, Chris Kirk. I mean, yeah. Yeah, right. He exactly. Um, so you also have to realize, you know, I, there's that side of it. If, if you really do want to look silky smooth, you better have the capability to swing crazy fast with, with full effort. Um, because looking silky smooth with an 80 mile an hour club head speed, that's not going to be fun. I don't care <laughs> how much fun you get from looking silky smooth, yeah. right? Um, it's great to look silky smooth when it's really fast, like Ernie Els or Freddie Couples. EJ Swing looks smooth, but that guy is is going after it. Um, and then there's some modern day guys that I think have – you perceive that their efforts though. Like I would say a Max Homa is someone who looks very you know, mm-hmm. controlled. He, he, his facial muscles aren't tensing up. But that guy's going after it. You know, he 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 just looks silky smooth. But then you then you have guys like like Victor Hovland's at, out there at ninety eight percent max effort with his driver. You know, like his ball speeds in the high one seventies. Um, I would be shocked if he could hit one eighty five ball speed. I don't. I I'm very sure he could not. I mean, um, so he's playing at a crazy high percentage of his maximum. Scotty Scheffler, the, you know, the strokes gain beat a green machine last year. He's, he's pretty far from silky smooth. You know, that guy, it looks like on most tee shots, he's, he, he looks how I want that. That's the, that's, he's my go-to guy when some, when someone's, you know, struggling to make progress with the stack, we have about 0.5% of our users gain less than three miles per hour. And so I, I, those are the folks that I really like to help. And I'll look at their swing and I know they're not a training swing. And I'm like, we got to ramp up the effort level here. And I'll be like, look at you with the stack. No worry about where the ball's going to go. And now let's look at Scotty Scheffler trying to win a major on hole 18. <laughs> it looks like he's got 10 times more effort than you do. <laughs> You've got no ball to hit. You got nothing to worry about. He's falling all over the place. Um, you know, that – so – I don't know. I'd, I'd take, I'd, yeah, no, I'd take sure. Scotty. Sh- Scotty Scheffler's having a lot of fun playing golf. <laughs> I think. Yeah, he, cer- he certainly is. Yeah. He's fun to watch the, uh, but it's, you know, it's that sneaky speed, I guess, really. When you, th- when you look at some of those former players that it looked effortless, not for or even current players that look effortless. Um, yeah. The club that's still really moving. Yeah. Uh, so it can be deceptive. Sasha, I can't thank you enough. Can you tell us what's the next frontier for the stack? You've got all this data now, 17 million swings, I think it was. Yeah. Um, where, where, where is this thing? Where's all this going? We've got uh, so many 
many uh, projects and directions. Um, so there's the learning library um, where I want folks to be able to go in, um, have some some thoughts about what they can work on in their swing. Um, so, and we're going to, you know, start to play those in the set breaks. You got three minutes there. So we're going to, you know, do our best to try and figure out, make some recommendations. If you're swinging, you know, relatively fast with the heavyweights, but relatively s slower with the lightweights, there are some of those swing tip videos, concepts, feels, thoughts that are, that are more applicable to you. Um, so we'll try to target those. Um, we have uh, related to that two features that I'm excited to uh, to work on that are eventually going to come together. Um, we want people to be able to record their own swing. So uh, the general idea is that um, during a set, uh, you know, you've just finished a set, you got three minutes, be able to tap a few buttons, set your phone up to record your swing <clears throat> for a swing in the, in the, in the stack set. That gets uploaded, so now it's kind of saved in posterity. So it's like this is how I was swinging on that day. So you'll be able to, you know, when you, all the data saved in the app, so you can go back and look through every workout session. But you'll be able to identify which ones have swings saved with them. Um, but there's, uh, I don't know how long this is going to take, but it's a, you know, pipe dream. We're chipping away at it. Is I can, you know, very quickly for the vast majority of users look at a swing and recommend what tip videos I would like to give them, right? Okay, this person's casting, this person's staying on their back foot, this person doesn't have a great transition sequence, these are the four videos that they should watch. Um, I During my PhD thesis, I was uh, really big into um, AI programming. I wrote my own um, genetic algorithm uh, to, to the optimization of a forward dynamics model. Uh, I'd like to incorporate some machine learning into this, um, so the idea is to be able to extract some quantitative data. There's lots of solutions out there now from the user swing. So they swing the stack, you upload the video, you know, you, you, everybody's seen the markerless uh, technology. So we extract some of that data and then have uh, the app watch me. First, there's going to be stages. So they're going to watch what videos I recommend. So then the app will be able to, the AI on the app will be able to associate the parameters, swing parameters that are pulled from that video with the tip video selections that I make, right? That'll be phase one training. Phase two, I will go in, start this process, but the app will make the guesses. Then I will approve them or correct them. This will refine uh, the, the, the machine learning algorithms. And then eventually, hopefully, we get to a point where I'm watching, but I don't have to make any corrections. Um, so this AI will be essentially behaving exactly like I would. So if I looked at Tom Swing and I think, ah, oh, he's not doing a great job of using the trail leg and the, you know, to generate angular momentum, like I think he should. Here are some videos. Um, I let the AI go. Hey, those are the exact videos I would have picked. Great. Um, so that's. That's uh, one feature that we'd, uh, you know, we'd like to incorporate um, along with uh, being able to upload your your videos. But there's um, there's a million things. Wow. That, yeah, we got in the pipeline. Being able to set up speed competitions, um, <laughs> where uh, when you go in, instead of just saying, "Hey, uh, let's see who gains the most speed," there'll be like sliders, so you can set weightings for. Uh, let's say Tom and I, we're going to have a competition. Um, how much emphasis do we want to put on how much speed we gain, how much emphasis do we want to put on our starting speed. So it's not really fair if, Tom, you're already swinging at 125 miles an hour and I'm starting at 80, right? You should have some, um, you know, value added from the fact that you're already swinging fast. And then grit score, how much emphasis do we want to put on how closely we adhere to the program. So that, that allows, you know, uh, groups of people or individuals to compete in, in a more fair way instead of who can gain the most speed, uh, you know, then people could cherry pick yeah. and start out slower. But lots of ideas coming with the with the stacks. Fantastic! It's like handicapping a good. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, handicapping a uh, a match. You yeah. Know? So uh, so that you can compete compete for speed, and that's fascinating. That should be a, a that'll have to be another podcast. The uh, the impact AI is going to have on golf teaching. Um, yeah, fascinating stuff, Sasha. This has been brilliant. Just want to remind everyone, all our Broken Tea Society members. You can go to your member locker and get 20% off 
the stack system. Uh, I'm a user. I know pretty much everyone in the audience probably is as well. So again, thanks so much for your time and thanks for, hey, thanks for the speed. All right. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening, everyone. And if you enjoyed this episode, we strongly encourage you to become a member of the Golfer's Journal, or if you already are, to share it with your friends. As a reader-supported publication, we couldn't do it without you. We also couldn't do it without the help of our partners, and they are Titleist, Scotty Cameron, Footjoy, Link Soul, Omega, Charles Schwab, and BMW. We'll see you next time on the Golfer's Journal podcast. Bye.